Hi everybody. Uh, this is the this is the only time I've ever spoken about this subject in public, and it'll probably be the only time I ever will. So what you're seeing here is a one-off, mainly because it's not what I'm I'm really particularly interested in, but it's still something that has creeped into my life. Now the first thing I want to say is I want to make a confession and come out of the closet. Not literally. What I mean is that when I was 17 years old, I had a quote-unquote supernatural experience, paranormal experience, whatever you want to call it. I had it. It happened to me. I detail it in the book, Reject and Survive. But luckily enough, I was able to process it at the time. I was a fairly sort of rational teenager, and I put it down to being a lucid dream because it happened on a Saturday morning. But the experience never left me, and through the years, I, had sp I talked to other people about this, and I had read books and it wasn't until I read uh, Jacques Vallée's book, Messengers of Deception, and another book by uh, John Keel, Our Haunted Planet, that I first saw there was something very real to the paranormal. Now, I was never anti-paranormal. I was never anti, you know, people having these experiences. I never assumed they were nuts or anything like that. But I never put much faith in what I was hearing because it just seemed to me so much of it, particularly in the sort of alien stuff, was sort of pre-predictive of science fiction on TV and stuff like that. So I'm not saying there couldn't be aliens visiting the Earth. I'm just saying that's how I always saw it. But it also made me realize that these experiences are culturally specific and they're also historically specific. So what one person may see, a light in the sky, it may be a Virgin Mary to one of them, a UFO to another, and all, you know, it could be some kind of Hindu deity to someone else. Uh, this is uh, very interesting in the sense that many of these events seem to be triggered by psychological and emotional trauma. That seemed to be a common factor, both culturally and personally. The trauma seemed to trigger these events. And the purpose, the name of this talk today is called The Demons of the Mind, question mark, because I don't know the answers. This is, a, this is not a polemic. I'm not here to tell you I'm right, you're wrong. I know what I'm talking about. This is, what I, this is how I've approached this subject, and if you can come to me afterwards and talk some more about it, I want to hear it, because it's a learning process for me too. Now, as I said, it comes from trauma in many cases. And a lot of my work in the psychopaths and stuff, there, it's pretty dark, it goes into pretty dark places, but it's when you go into the dark side is when you can really uncover what the light is, for instance, and you can find the truth. If you go into an art gallery and you look at, say, a, a Francis Bacon painting and you have this image of this sort of man's tortured consciousness trying to resolve his homosexuality or his alcoholism through these very disturbing paintings, you're not so much looking at the painting and examining that. You're really looking at, at Francis Bacon and you're looking at the artist's the artist actual consciousness. And so that's to me is what's so key to all this. If someone has an experience and they see the Virgin Mary or they see a UFO, I'm not interested in the object they're looking at. I'm interested in the person having that experience and I want to know why. Because I think that's key in the same way because you're getting an open window into that person's consciousness. So Carl Jung said here, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And believe me, that's so incredibly true. And this is why, you know, we must not, you know, deny that we have a shadow, that we have a shadow as a culture and a society and a collective and a personal, because it's, it's by working on that shadow and engaging with that shadow that we resolve both poles of cognitive functioning between our conscious and subconscious lives so we can reach towards things like even individuation at the end of our lives where we can have a rounding out of our lives, which is the purpose of most Jungian psychoanalysis. Now, how I got back into this again recently, I interview a lot of people who've been in abusive relationships and amazingly, so many of them had supernatural experiences, at the, particularly at the point of the relationship where it was really bad, really abusive. A lot of had, this had to do with changes in brain chemistry, which is what happens during an abusive situation and through post-traumatic stress injury. You have disruptions in brain chemistry, which can lead to, I'm not going to say hallucinations, but it may be some kind of, well, I actually think it is, some kind of fracturing of reality that causes these experiences to happen. It could be a compensatory thing for the psyche. It could be a way of trying to resolve the tension. It could even be a healing process in itself. 
But some of the things that were reported would be the room would become increasingly cold when the psychopath entered. I've heard this from police officers who would be interviewing psychopaths. Lights would be dimmering, dimming or flickering, particularly uh, fluorescent lighting. The psychopath talking in strange sounding archaic languages in their sleep. That's a really bizarre one. Uh, that's been quite reported by women quite a lot. A loss of physical en energy when the psychopath was nearby. When you'd actually be around them, you would actually feel tired. Even if they weren't particularly aggressive in any kind of overt way, you would feel tired. The psychopath's uh, face changing to a bizarre, uh, almost like a surrealist entity out of the blue, particularly when they were, they were angry and objects and moving by themselves, emotional uh, trauma causing books to fly off wall. Now Jung called this cat catalytic exteriorization phenomena. This happened when he was having a row with Freud. Uh, Freud wanted to make a dogma of the sexual theory. Jung was moving towards a more sort of archetypal understanding through Eastern philosophy. The two concepts came to a head and a book flew off uh, Jung's bookcase after uh, Freud's bookcase after Jung felt an incredible powerful energy force in his chest and that's where the division in psychology and psychiatry happened at that point. It was really a supernatural experience which created this. And targets having a strange sense of reality following the, uh, the experience. I first heard about this about 15 years ago. I was, I was going through around Europe I was listening to the BBC World Service and they had uh, the, the history of British radio, whatever, and one was a documentary from the 1930s, a radio documentary, where they interviewed soldiers, doctors and nurses who had treated uh, British troops coming back from World War I who suffered from post-traumatic stress, uh, what they called shell shock back then. And they, all they would have to hear in the hospital would be a loud bang and the the poor guy would run under the bed and hide and stay there and wait until a nurse or a doctor gave them the all clear. When they got the all clear, they came up. But what was most remarkable about this was these guys didn't have a flashback in the sense that they suddenly remembered it. They would describe it as that they literally went back to the trenches. Their arms would be wet. They could smell the cordite from the exploding shell. Uh, they were not remembering the experience. They were actually having the experience again. And that was very strange as well. And the doctors were very uh, forthright about this, that these men were actually having this experience. And then a sensation of dying or an outer body kind of experience following D&D, &D, which is devalue and discarding. A psychopath always uses a person up, robs them of all their energy, and then devalues them and discards them. And the people would often just talk about a sense of, just be a sense that they were outside their body and otherworldliness. And these things were very commonly reported. And so this is what brought this subject back into my life again. So I came up with this, this uh, it's a bit of a silly term, but it's the only one I could come up with in a modern sense, stress-related dynamic consciousness. The idea that consciousness can actually change reality through stressful situations. Now, when I say change reality, I mean they could actually manifest things, lights in the sky, and I'm going to give, and so on. And I'm going to give you some examples of this true history, which I think fit this model. The events are real and not real at the same time. Yes, these people are having a genuine experience. They're not kooks, they're not hallucinating. This is really happening to them in their lives. And it's real and not real at the same time. Because if it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's some kind of trigger from their consciousness, then it is a sort of hallucination, but it's also almost like a rebuilding of reality. It's created by the mind as perhaps a, co a coping mechanism or as a response to the target's intuition. It can be collectively experienced in terms of religious uh, experiences. It can, it's, apparently it can be photographed, filmed, or even audio recorded, but I would not trust anything from the modern age because with CGI you simply can't trust anything anymore. That's why films that were done in, say, 16 millimeters in the past that have like strange phenomena on them are much more reliable than modern ones because they simply can't be digitized. I, that, I, discount, I discount all footage that's that from the modern age simply because of the, you just can't trust anything with the CGI. There's an enormous body of evidence going back centuries. I was presenting some of that. And it's an insight into the awesome power of the human mind and our personal and collective ability to literally alter the fabric of reality, either consciously or unconsciously. And that's two parts of this presentation. Unconsciously seem to happen through trauma. Consciously, can we do it ourselves? But there still remains a spiritual battle of sorts. Now, Yes, I do believe there's a spiritual identity to all human beings. What it is, I haven't a clue. I'm not that clever. But I do know there's another aspect to our existence. It's probably rooted in, uh, 
It's probably rooted in some aspect of our consciousness. In fact, I'd nearly say it is. And it's, it's either intention or mind control. Your intention or someone else's mind control can determine the experience for you. Now, everybody's seen this uh, image, the Flammarion woodcut, very beautiful piece of art uh, from the Middle Ages. And there's a, a man who's come, he's looking through the fabric of reality and he's staring up into a sort of an alternate universe. He's carrying a cane to represent the fact that he's traveled a long way to get there. This is why when you have people who say, I went on a course for two weeks and I'm now a shaman. That's not possible. These are, these, these are very difficult lifelong experiences that take you to get to the levels where you can actually understand the nature of reality and the nature and the, that in reality, in quotes, it's also why in indigenous cultures they celebrate the elders. They don't give these things to 30 and 40 year olds. It's, that's why the older people are generally the wise elders within the community. These wheels in the sky are interesting here. Carl Jung speculated that that was the first archetype of a flying saucer, that it was the first compensatory, compensatory thing based on the idea of Ezekiel's wheel. I think there's a lot of, a lot of sense to that. But it's, uh, this, this, this is a very deep graphic that people, they see on a very sort of uh, a basic level, but you could spend hours reading into this. I even think there's a simulacra here of a face looking at the sun. The sun is not looking at him, it's looking at this tree here, and there's like a, a, a strange kind of simulacra here, which could be some kind of an embed, very common in medieval art, to convey other, you know, other aspects within the graphic, and I'm gonna show you a very powerful ex uh, example of that soon. Now, one of the things, we have this, this notion that we, we, uh, we only have psychology now to like, help us explore our consciousness and deal with aspects of our consciousness, but we've really had other things. It's, religion has been a good, big part of that, and things like uh, the tarot, astrology even, and alchemy was a way of dealing with ha having the psyche compensate, and this is a very a remarkable uh, graphic from 1616, which shows the steps of the alchemical process, but it shows it in the sense of uh, the psyche. The alchemical mountain represents the person in perfect balance. You have aspects of the psyche, beauty, vanity, valor, destruction, narcissism, and so on. Mercury represents duality, which would be like individuation within a uh, psych psych psychoanalysis. And the moon, and the, the, you go from the solar aspects to the lunar aspects. Inside here, you have the house, but it's really a beehive. The real, the the reason why a beehive is uh, special in esoteric uh, practice is because of the same temperature as the human body. And I won't go too deeply into this graphic, but basically you have within the etheric up here, the, uh, the zodiac. Essentially what the graphic means in the alchemical sense is if you're not balanced as a person physically, the internal part represents the metabolic, by the way. This represents the personality of the psyche. If the mountain structure does not hold, this collapses and the demons of the mind, whatever they are, fall in. And that becomes things like addictions and also what we would call paranormal exp uh, experiences. Now, this, what's interesting about this graphic is these two lads down here. This guy here is walking around with a blindfold because he's clueless. He doesn't he doesn't explore his consciousness. He watches Coronation Street. He, he has no higher aspect to his life. So he's, he, he's, this is the medieval sheeple. And uh, this guy here is a guy who's chasing a hare into a hole in the mountain. And he's aware that there's something more to his reality and his experience as a human being. But he doesn't know where to look. He's chasing the hare instead of exploring his consciousness. So we've always had people and always had systems and compensatory systems for issues with the psyche all throughout history. Now, this is uh, one of the most important quotes I think ever written. Carl Jung wrote the very first book on flying saucers. And this, this slide, this year's space aliens, last year's angels, and next year's ghosts. And this is Jung's words here. In the threatening situation of the world today, this was written in the late 1940s, by the way, during the, the, atomic, the, the birth of the atomic age, when people are beginning to see that familiar, that everything that's, is at stake, the projection creating fantasy soars beyond the realm of earthly organization and powers into the heavens, into interstellar space, where the rulers of human fate, the gods, once had their abode in the planets. Under these circumstances, it would not be at all surprising if those sections of the community who ask themselves nothing, this is going to be quite significant, were visited by visions, by a widespread myth seriously believed in some, by some, and rejected as absurdity by others. And that was in a book called Flying Saucers that he wrote. What Jung was saying was, 
When the collective psyche breaks down, in the case of this, the Cold War, the beginning of the Cold War, manifestations appear in the heavens and the they were appearing as flying saucers in the 1950s. Prior to that, they were appearing as Foo Fighters over Germany. As the last days of the, the Third Reich was collapsing, you had these lights following US fighter pilots. Strange lights following them around. It's a projection of the tortured consciousness of the society, manifesting as a vision in the heavens. Now, I'm not saying this explains all paranormal, but I'm just saying this is a really good one. This, to me, makes a lot of sense. And I think Jung nailed it then. I think he really did. And uh, this, is, this is a very important thing when we're exploring these things. You see, we need to be skeptical about everything, including what we're told is paranormal. We can't say it's definitely an, an alien from space or it's definitely a demon or something like that. It could be something so unbelievably complex we may even not know what it is. And that's why when dogma comes in where it's, people start assigning terms and names to things, that becomes very dangerous because then you're no longer an open-minded skeptic or you're even having a metaphysical exploration that you're buying into a dogma. You're becoming, a, you're becoming a religious. A tulpa, very interesting, Sanskrit word, means to create. It basically what it is, I won't read it out here, but in states of crisis or a state of panic among a peasant society, a, a thought form in terms of a wild animal or a creature can be actually created by the neuroses of the, uh, of the community. They would start, like for instance, there was a thing in the 1970s of white fans traveling around the United States abducting children. The, the model of white fan, it kind of became an urban legend and these white fans were being seen and photographed all over the place, yet they didn't actually exist. They were just, uh, they were just part of this kind of Tulpa experience. It also happens when strangers are traveling through uh, you know, mysterious countryside, they will actually, they're so frightened by the, uh, the strangeness of the place that they actually imagine they see things, strange animals or strange voices. And the, the tulpa is one that a, a Buddhist monk could actually create. They could sit down and they could say they wanted to create a monster or something. If they kept meditating for months and months and months and months, well, it could actually happen, technically. And it's very similar to the idea of the, what Jung was saying. Signs in the sky. I mean, I don't know how many UFO books have this picture in it of these orbs in the sky or every of these documentaries on the Discovery Channel, and they're UFOs, they're alien spacecraft. Well, I looked into this graphic and it was taken, it's actually done in Switzerland, at a time when there was tremendous crisis in Europe. There was a fear of an Islamic invasion, the Ottomans in the southeast, the, the Moors coming in from the south, and the Huns coming across the, uh, the Danube. So this would have been, they would have been right in the central Europe. They would have been freaking out at the idea of like their, their whole society collapsing under this sort of Islamic invasion. And again, we get lights in the sky. And this is a constant motif all through history. We get lights in the sky, lights in the sky, all whenever there's a crisis or anything like this.